Hi everyone, and today is my privilege again to have Marius and Leo here to share more about the Symbolic AI Framework. So the last tutorial session we had, we talked about Symbia, a chatbot assistant that has memory that can use tools. And you thought that probably that's about it, right? But there's so many more tools that Marius and Leo have not shared. And so today we will take a look at some of them. So without further ado, let's have uh, Marius. Um, we'd like to share with us, please. Yes, thank you. Thanks again for having us here. Um, so quickly, I'm going to share my screen. You should see now, hopefully, the screen of the notebook. Um, you see it? Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. So yeah, uh, again, thank you for having us again here. Um, uh, yeah, me and Leo were basically uh, developing further on some, some new features, but also want to show some features that we already had before uh, in there, uh, but were maybe not so prominent uh, presented uh, within the readme's or other stuff. So um, yeah, without any further ado, let, let's start importing our symbolic AI framework, uh, which is basically uh, just some AI thing. Um, then uh, what we have as an experimental feature right now, and uh, I want to also announce a bit of caution here because there are OS commands that we're sending out. Um, uh, so it's it, and it's really bare bones. So if you want to delete the file system, you delete the file system. So you should be really, really cautious with this, what you're doing. But the cool idea about this component that we have here um, is that, yeah, okay. Sorry, could jump over my OS. Does not jump over. Fine, I will look it up then. Um, so in the in the extension that we have here right now, we can basically send out OS commands, which is detecting your own platform that you're kind of using. Um, and then what you see here is basically depending on you know if it's Linux, Windows, Mac, or whatever. Uh, we're sending out different, you know, PowerShell bash commands or other stuff. And we're translating using GPT-4, obviously, to these commands and instructing how to, you know, process commands and in, in which way we have a few, few short examples and, you know, some, some templating of how we basically build up this, this command um, representation. Um, so without any further ado, let's try something out uh, like... Um, initialize this OS command also with some tools. So in this case, we have Spotify initialized, but also all the system built-in commands will be available. Um, and also give it some metadata because we want to, let's say, play some music on Spotify, which should uh, basically pop up if I call this play a song on Spotify. This should basically trigger now. Um, uh, as you see here, this is the command that will be executed. And yeah, here we go. Oh. Um, so we yeah. hear it. I have yeah, you hear it. Yeah. Um, if I don't specify the program, can I let the OS run that program? Or must I specify it in the program's uh, variable? So you have all the OS available tool or programs already in here. So if we say, let's say, I don't know, a notepad, I know that that's for instance a tool on, on Microsoft. So if I just say like, you know, open notepad or whatever, it's, I could say open notepad, it doesn't really matter. Uh, then you see that it also pops up Microsoft native tools. It's basically depending on the world knowledge of the large language model, what it knows about the respective uh, platform, yeah. then it basically can open those up these tools also. Uh, but if we have, let's say, you know, you have probably different tools and applications installed on your machine with different, you know, paths and so on. So that's the reason why we also have this list of programs that we can put in here. And the idea is that this list of programs here uh, gets in the context of the LLM. So it sees like this list of all the programs and tools that are available on that platform. Um, and then it tries to translate basically whatever you write in here as a, as a request and so on, tries to find it in the list of programs and tries also to use a bit of world knowledge of it uh, because it also knows how to interpret, for instance, the metadata here. It knows that actually can just uh, stick together Spotify uh, column and then this uh, link, which is basically not uh, nothing else happening than just um you know calling uh, starting a process with st spotify and a parameter and this parameter gets interpreted by the spotify app actually directly that's the reason how or the way this workflow actually goes 
close by. Obviously, it could be more explicit, give maybe a few short examples in the future and, and you know, be, be more, more explicit what you want, how to parameterize things and so on. But just as a short demo, and as, like I said, this is experimental. We're drawing some stuff in this direction. Uh, you could basically directly condition and control your OS um, to, um, yeah, start any tools that you provide. Oh, that's quite nice. So, so as I understand it, actually the constraint is not on the OS command side because you can run anything on your terminal, Windows, command prompt. You can run anything there. It's a matter of, because this will be fed into a large language model to process your intents, yeah. and then out comes the system specific message for like a Mac, for Windows, for Linux. So the exactly. thing is whether the large language model knows what's on your computer. Yes, so that's of why course. we need to give it this progress metadata if it's something specific to your computer itself. But if it's exactly. something general, like Notepad, I guess if you have some games like Minesweeper, all these are like, okay, maybe this is specific as well because the games keep changing, but uh, generic stuff like Notepad, um, like, you know, my computer, those kind of things will be more or less known by the large language model and you don't have to give it, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly, because it knows like on, on Windows probably just has to execute Notepad and it opens up Notepad or, yeah. or a can bash or whatever. To, can I try to break it? So like I'm going to I'm, <laughs> I'm ask it a uh, command like I would like to draw something. Uh, I like to color something. So I don't tell you the application. Can it, mm -hmm. can it open? I, I, I kind of doubt that. Uh, but let's see. I kind of doubt it, that it can really translate to paint or something like that. But uh, I have also built in, if it's not a really specific thing that it can recognize as a tool, instead of just doing some weird commands, uh, it will say just, sorry, not supported, because that's as well one of the default behaviors. I really want to be explicit on this because it's dangerous, right? I mean, depending on how the LLM interprets and things, you can just delete file systems and so on, right? So that's why I'm saying, be cautious. It's, uh, it's experimental. Um, and it has, in this case, a fallback on just if it's not explicit on the programs list or it is, cannot associate it with uh, immediately with a clear tool, then it will just, you know, fade out and say, no, sorry. How about uh, if I say open a coloring tool? Will, will that work? Um, I can say it this way, open a paint tool. I don't know. Yeah, MS, MS Paint is apparently so must be paint extremely tool. specific with your request right now, right? Although, I mean, it's quite unspecific if you think of it this way. I mean, MS Paint is the actual tool. So it knows how to translate open a paint, paint tool. So a tool to paint, but it doesn't talk about the MS Paint, uh, which is the command actually. So it, it knows to translate, for instance, that opening a painting tool or, or what, what was your exact command? Uh, open a coloring tool. So I, wonder if, I, wonder if that, I wonder if that would work. Coloring <laughs> tool. Yeah, I, I don't I think, think this uh, is again too I, interesting. I don't think it would work. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, exactly. So, I think this uh, OS commands is interesting. You can say what you want in a verbose way, but generally mm -hmm. what you want must be already included in the prompt. Like you must already know what you want to open or what you want to do. And I exactly. uh, thought said just now, like I, I actually uh, wanted to check like whether or not you can delete your own files. And he mentioned it, you can delete your whole directory. So I think uh, in order to make this, uh, this is experimental. So we like to hear your mm -hmm. feedback on this as well. Uh, but in order to make this more uh, operational, I think one way to do it is to feedback to the user, like the intended action the mm -hmm. AI is intending to take, then ask for confirmation. So like, for example, mm -hmm. we can even do like, I would like to have a coloring tool. Then you can process it in a, very non-strict way. You can do a very flexible way because there's so many options. Then the AI can return back one option and then confirm the user first before they open it. Or like, mm -hmm. I want to delete my entire computer. Then it will confirm. Are you sure you want to? <laughs> yeah. So I think that that is probably something that could be extended for this. So it can mm -hmm. really yeah, we can like a chatbot. Uh, uh, what, exactly what I wanted to mention. Uh, we also had this idea to um, basically chat with all, with your OS. So uh, mm -hmm. if, if you take this to extreme, like you would have a, a chatbot that uh, would basically, it's like your OS talking back to you. So this goes in that direction a little bit uh, of what yes, you said. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I can imagine this and, being and... integrated in like a Symbia based kind of chat. And then like as part of Symbia's action list, you call this OS command. Yes, and we yeah. actually have a larger vision with this also. Uh, Leo mentioned it partially. 
Uh, but like the larger vision where we want to head out also with the symbolic AI framework is uh, we want to have like, uh, uh, we, we already mentioned that in the, in the first video, if you remind yourself uh, about the software 3.0 thing, right? So where we say that programs become adaptable, right? So you just tell it, I don't know, I want my, uh, I don't know, dark theme to switch over to a uh, light theme or something like that. So you basically just instruct that uh, and then it finds the right tools, finds because it uh, understands about the metadata of what these tools are, what config files they have. And you kind of start adapting and changing uh, things. But this is just one step towards that. So we're, we're, we're far away still from, from, from that, but this is a direction that we kind of follow. Uh, and maybe in the future also have code adaptations. So basically where large language right. models start code adapting your own application. So imagine you have an interpreted uh, program, which is like Python coded tool or whatever. And then you ask it something specific, what was maybe never intended by the program itself actually. Um, but then there's a different color palette that you just want to have. And then it just adapts directly uh, the code base and switches over for instance, right? Why not? I mean, this is the, the ideas are wild, but these are the first stepping stones. Uh, yeah. So, that. so one, uh, they are wild, but uh, uh, maybe just to add this, and then we can move on. Um, they are wild, but for example, if you think about a JSON uh, structure, right? A JSON structure can be uh, represented with uh, a grammar. And that would basically enforce a 100% uh, verification process uh, uh, over your uh, output data structure. So mm -hmm. we know that some programs can be verified, uh, right? Some of them only by syntax, I agree, uh, not semantically that they doing uh, the right thing, but at least in terms of syntactic validation, you can achieve this, right? And that's what, both me and Mario think it's it's the it's the strongest point of uh, code generation, and that's why a lot of people, if you look, they ground their uh, models into uh, code because if you do this, then the model is biased to find relationships that follow like a, a programming language structure, which is much more organized, right? It it, it has a context sensitive uh, structure, if you want. And we will show this at the end of the video. So stick to it a bit. Yeah, that, we that too. Some, some, that too. some very nice, uh, nice parts. But that's okay, let's cool. move on. Yeah, that's quite cool. Yeah. So yeah, the next thing is um, we wanted to still, it's an important thing to process over documents, right? And to process information out of documents and uh, to make it even easier and easier for, for people to, to do that. Um, some of the components that we want to show today also is like to say, some document extraction and 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 you know um, information extraction and maybe some some reparsing of information a different structure. So I'll just create a function uh, as we as we know it uh, that we can use uh, from our framework. Then we basically we showed that in the last video, but now we also use a file reader to read in you know uh, documents and so on. And in this case, one of the documents that we want to read in is a PDF. It's my resume. It's uh, yeah, it's just some thingy that I have on my PC right now. Uh, and here is basically, let's, let's take a snippet out of it. So you see my name very clearly and, and some, some metadata and some skills and whatever is, is in here. So, um, and now we can basically use this function that we basically just process over the PDF. And then we can answer the question that was up here. And the question was maybe to remind you, extract the person mentioned the document, which is a fairly easy question basically. But you see here, like uh, you can extract in this case a name. You can maybe you know put extract the last name where it's probably just inferring that the last position is probably the last name, uh, which is in this case by implication correct. Um, but yeah, th these are some things. But maybe more interesting processing uh, or you know uh, yeah transformations of information would be to reformat this the structure. So my entire you know PDF uh, resume thingy here. Um, to reformat that, maybe I'll quickly just pull it up also that you see how it is actually structured. Um, where is it? I just have to quickly find it in my... Yeah, while, uh, while Marius is finding it, just, uh, just to let everyone know, I'm actually very happy that there's this JSON supporting framework uh, because I myself also creating some framework to pass output into JSON. And this is basically, you can specify what you want like you can specify like in this case a job and then like what's the output format in this case a string 
And then the LM can pass the output for you in that JSON format. Uh, this is very useful because as you all know, large language models are quite verbose. So if we constrain mm -hmm. them to output only JSON, the output tends to be more concise, more to the point, and you can easily reference the right section of the output for your downstream tasks. So I'm very glad that Symbolic AI has a JSON uh, implementer as well. If not, I was uh, going to implement something like that also <laughs> on Symbolic AI. So I think this is the way ahead. A lot of the use cases for large language models will involve some form of JSON passing some way or another in the pipeline, All right? And uh, exactly. just, just one, one, one quick thing I just wanted to add is the fact that we, we don't yet have the grammar backed structure of the JSON, but we plan to uh, implement that. So right now it's based on the, uh, on the context. So GPT-4 basically it's figuring it out. It's pretty good at it, exactly. obviously, but it's not 100%. <laughs> but you can make it 100%. Yeah. Exactly. I and mean, yeah, it can, can more, be more explicit. So yeah, without any further ado, this is the JSON parser that you just saw here, uh, which is a, also has its own function, how to extract things, has some templating, has some constraints on top of it and pre and post processing uh, that we do. And you can look it up in, in details. Uh, you saw the resume here. So basically just some dates and some you know companies where I worked at and, and so on. So we want to basically go over that uh, and get all the jobs maybe or, or companies or, or positions that I worked at. Um, and uh, we want to have it like in this kind of format. And that's the cool part because if you write just a string in here, like you see here jobs, then it, this one gets interpreted as um, uh, just a, a, hard, a key that has to be that is kind of mandatory in the document. And if this is not available, then it probably will throw an error after the post-processing goal kicks in and so on. Um, and all the like formatting curly braces escape representations that we have here as the keys uh, are, will be replaced and not verified, but it gives like the structure what we want to have. This is part of a, think of it this way, as, as Leo said, this is, there's, we want to enforce a grammar, a certain structure. Um, and we're kind of giving examples in this case. So we're not giving the grammar in this case directly, but we're giving instances of a grammar uh, by, by this formatting, but we're escaping that these get enforced and verified in the output processing. So what we do here is now extract all job positions and hiring years uh, from the document, we go over the document. Um, it basically just looks at all these things that you saw here um, and tries to, to make sense of it, GPT-4 specifically, um, and then extracts this format. So it finished and we can look at it and we see the first key which is mandatory is jobs so but by the way what comes back is a valid json like you can work with it as a json object uh, so what you see here now is basically the jobs key which is mandatory and then a, a list starts as you see here but now each job one job two and so on gets replaced uh and and with the uh, senior researcher and so on and you see here october to present and so on this is the entire document um, with all the jobs and so on that it extracted, which is really neat because it basically just went over the entire thing and and uh, nice. formatted in a way that I, I can now integrate are, in the system. You are CEO in 2016, 2018. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. Exactly. Some venture there. I'm just curious, um, uh, because like this is slightly different from my strict JSON framework, how do you get it to output multiple jobs? Because like you look at your initial one, it's just job one and job two. Like, how do you get it to output multiple such jobs in the eventual JSON? So th this is not by implication of the of the um, GPT-4 model. It sees that one, two, maybe we could give it a third one uh, and so on. And then it basically just okay, assumes that this is a continuous uh, stream of, of jobs. And the, you, you enforce it basically uh, by providing also the right uh, template. So this, this JSON template that is used here, um, from the from the prompt, where is the prompt uh, formatter, post processors prompts, and there we have some where the JSON temp. Uh, what was it? Here. It so yeah. yeah, exactly. So we have this this thing here, and you see that there is some description how it should like interpret this format. You see also that there are some start and ending tags. So this is uh, also in line with as as Leo kind of said. Uh, how we want it to give it a grammar so that it knows that there's a start sequence of tokens, if you want, so in the end sequence of tokens. If that is violated, then it tries to retry the processing again and conditions it 
um, but you, you see that there are some some description on how to format uh, the on how to interpret the uh, attributes and all these, these these things in the in the description that you saw here. Nice. Yeah. So yeah. the curly braces within the double quotes are placeholders, as what you mentioned, and they will exactly. These are like placeholders. They will be replaced exactly. dynamically by GPT four, according yeah. to context. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, that's that's how this works. Um, then we have also the document retrieval of large documents. I mean, usually you're you're not just processing something that you can fit in the memory of the model. Uh, last time we saw also the streaming over you know chunks and so on, but sometimes just you know streaming in chunks and especially in a sequential way over the document is is not quite the uh, the way to go because you want to maybe you know in this case GPT four you want to. Uh, have the entire paper in your memory if you want so, and then you know pull parts of the paper or ask parts of the paper um, about like have questions about it or use it for for some conditional interpretations and so on. So what we're doing here is basically uh, we have pinecone in the background. So what you see here is the document retriever. The document retriever is is a component that just uh, works together with with different other components. So it's basically. Um, where is it? Uh, I think is one of the components things. And then we have document retrieval. Sorry for, because my search apparently doesn't work on the system right now. So I'm trying to figure this one out. It, is it an expression? So. It is no, here I think, actually. I you think you put it in extended. You put is it, it in. is an extended. Yeah. But yeah. Um, here is a document. Yeah. So thank you. Um, yeah. So you, you see this as an extended feature because it's basically it's a composite feature of, of existing ones that you already know. So if we want to make it as easy as possible for you to you know use the framework. Um, and we use, for instance, also our own file reader here, as you see. So we can just load yeah. the PDF. And then we have here the indexer, which is uh, basically indexing a file. Uh, so it kind of, the file gets cut into different pieces. And then all of these get basically uh, as vector embedded. And these vectors basically end up in a database and a data store. Uh, this is in this, in this case, a vector store. Um, and then you um, get, get back an index, which you can just put queries on top. And this is what we re return. So you, you right. basically just see when we instantiate this thing, you can just get a retriever object back and then you can just directly ask questions. Uh, so if we go back um, to this... the, the code again for document retriever, uh, mm -hmm. just want to highlight, this is exactly how you create expressions, right? This is the format yes. for expressions. So in essence, yes. this document retriever is taking the file reader and the indexer and making like, and the read, I uh, mean, file reader and indexer kind of expressions and making it a meta expression because it's a combination of, of sub components of earlier expressions. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, if you want to customize your own expressions, like this is something like a function, or I would like to call it a meta function. So it's like, if mm -hmm. you want to do a, a function that involves like other components, you can create your own expression like this as well. I think it's exactly the same kind of um, framework. And then you can mm -hmm. create your own composite process just like this, using this expression. Yes. Uh, yeah, just want to highlight. Exactly. Thank you. Um, and yeah, then we can place questions on top and, uh, you know, we can ask what's the conclusion. I mean, conclusion is very easy or straightforward because there is a, usually a huge banner or a section description that conclusion and the abstract maybe itself also. But you see that uh, fine tuning. So what it says here is basically the authors conclude that fine tuning large language models with human feedback is a promising way to align, blah, blah, blah. Um, and we can look at the GPT-4 paper, for instance. Uh, where we see that there is somewhere uh, uh, human performance uh, critical difficulties. Uh, yeah, models. So where is it? I think it's the last one. Uh, re results to improve safety and alignment. Yeah, could yeah could be. It basically just retrieves all this information that it finds. So the question is now, how do we split apart information and how do we index it? And there's for that thing we have basically different formatters or so, or you can basically see it uh, as a processors that kind of split the document either, let's say by paragraph wise, or it splits it apart. Of course, you could just chunk it at in individual stages. So you just say you have this context, which you can fit into the um, 
to to vectorize something, right? You have 4,000 something tokens and you can just chunk it there and then have these chunks. But sometimes it makes more sense to have, you know, paragraph wise split or a sentence wise split even depends on how you want to retrieve later on. Um, and yeah, then you get basically uh, the information when you then query it again, because that's, that's the whole, that's the point actually. When you ask them these questions, this get also vectorized this, this question and now I do it cosine similarity. And now in a way, some keywords here have to kind of match up with what you have in the paper, because this is how it retrieves information, right? So when you see conclusion of the paper, so then this conclusion part here should be somehow related with this parts below here, right? Because you want to retrieve it back as a, maybe an entire chunk because this has the highest similarity versus other parts talking about, uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, earlier GPT-4 and uh, latest GPT-4 versions with ex examples and so on. So, and, and th this is important now for the, actual formatting or chunking basically. And for that, we have different formatters, currently not the menu, we have a paragraph formatter, we have a uh, sentence formatter, but you could build in your own uh, individual formatters or smarter solutions for that, uh, that can maybe look like method wise, if you use it on code or other stuff, or you, that can go class wise or whatever. So it depends also on, on how long this, this token streams are. And there are some fallbacks also built in this paragraph formatter. So you can say that we first try to compute paragraphs. So that means like some backslash n, backslash n and whatever. Um, that's that's how we split it apart. And then if the paragraph becomes too huge, because sometimes paragraphs are huge, then we start further to uh, uh, chunking them down. And then there is also even a max uh, tokens ex exceeded uh, verification. That's, even if this is now exceeded, then we have to still split it apart. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's some, some tricks, obviously how to do this, but there might be some better uh, elaborate uh, either heuristics or ways to to define uh, better ways of splitting apart documents. Anyhow, uh, uh, I would like to say something over here. Uh, this is yeah, actually, sure. you know, uh, a lot of companies are saying that, oh, you give them some PDFs and you can talk to the PDF. Uh, this is exactly mm -hmm. the talk to PDF, or you can put a website or so you talk to website. I mean, as long as you have a chunk of text, this um, document retriever, uh, actually mm -hmm. backend is splitting into chunks and um, making their vectorization using the OpenAI embeddings. And then when you ask a question, it compares your query and finds out which are the most similar chunks to your query. It puts mm -hmm. them as context and then ask the question. So this is like retrieval augmented generation. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually quite a few companies are offering this as a service and here you have it free of charge on Symbolic AI. You just, how many lines did we take? Can we screw up? How many lines did we take to do this whole thing? One, actually, two, two. Yes. One, yeah, with the import one, two, three. So that's like three lines. Three lines. So uh, if you are interested to do talk to documents, you just need three lines here in Symbolic AI. I, I think that's quite powerful. And maybe you can share with us, like if you want to change my formatting, like where do I change the formatter in this uh, document retriever? So like, if I want to split by paragraph, for example, like where do I change it inside here? Uh, so you, just, uh, just to jump in, you, you just yeah. add the new parameter to the document receiver. You can write the class above in a new cell if you mm -hmm. want, and you just pass it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So let me quickly open up that. Yeah, so um, this will allow for some customization of how you want to split uh, whatever document you want to do it. So yeah, this is basically in the indexer happening. So you, here you see that uh, the indexer has to somehow, where is it? Uh, here, the formatter. So you see that the indexer basically has a, in this case, a paragraph formatter by default. Um, and you can basically just, you know, use uh, in the document retriever, basically any, uh, put another argument formatter and put any formatter you want in there. And it has to basically return a, a list of, um, of elements, so a list of strings in this case. That that's all what it does. Very nice. So I just need to have another variable called formatter equals to mm -hmm. like par paragraph format. Whatever you use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, this is paragraph format yeah. by default, but uh, yeah, there you can use whatever formatter you you kind of think of. Where is it? Um where is the formatter closed it up again? Yeah. Yeah, yes. I, think, yeah. I like to highlight another part of this uh, framework, which uh, initially I thought was quite convoluted, but now I appreciate it. Uh, maybe you go back to the document retriever part. So if you go back to document retriever, you realize that there's no variable called formatter up there. 
but it's actually in quarks. So the moment you put formatter equals something, it goes to quarks, uh, K-W-A-R-G-S, mm -hmm. and this will then be passed into like the indexer as well. The indexer, uh, exactly. Yeah. So and then you can, can uh, unwrap you can that. Do your meta level, um, your micro level variables can be passed at a meta level function. You don't have to rewrite the whole function. So um, that's the beauty of this framework, right? You can basically control mm -hmm. your lower level details just by passing the variables at the high level functions. Yeah. Um, th th that that's about that. Um, then we have, uh, yeah, that, that was document retriever. So, um, other things are basically, if we go no further, let's close this up again, make it a bit more clean. Uh, if we look at, let's say multimodal document processing, because you also know that probably you have some image, there's some text on it, or you have your audio file. Um, and what we developed for that is, um, you know, different, we interface with different tools and so on. Uh, we use different AI models or even APIs, depending on, on what, what is more convenient. Um, and what we have in this case here is, let's say, I don't know, some, some student bill statement that I've just pulled out from the internet with some, you know, entries here telling you about what is, uh, you know, some, some due fees and, and, and some total balance and so on. So we can, first of all, start uh, using one of our features that we call interfaces. Our interfaces because our main wrapper for all third-party interface tools. So um, we have LLMs where our built-in is a core engine, which you can also saw from the last time, replace with your own core engine if you want so. But then we have also like these all third-party tools and frameworks that we can integrate, uh, which we wrap under the interface uh, 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 expression which resolves basically in the background uh, the, the names for us. So interface has built in basically some, um, some way how to open up uh, in, in the semi AI extended interfaces uh, and then dot module, depending on what module is, is, is placed in here. So it could be OCR, it could be any other, one of the others. And then it kind of loads dynamically the class, which is then in semi AI um, and where is it extended interfaces? And here we have, for instance, all these tools like Whisper, uh, Blip2, Dali, and, uh, and all the others on OCR and so on. Um, and one of them is, for instance, this one. OCR in this case is just using the, uh, there's uh, API layer.org, I think, or dot .com. Um, so we're just using this, you know, call calling basically this, this third party API that kind of processes for us, uh, does the OCR, but you could, you know, implement it differently and then use a model or something like that that is locally available yeah so it's what we're doing nice, right? uh, because your expression can now be external you can do an external function using an API using this integration. exactly yeah. and in this case what we're doing is now just putting in this link here um under the OCR uh for expression we get back the bill if we visualize that so what we get from back from the API is basically language is detected as English apparently all text all text means that this is the text in the image that we see here. And then like a, just, you know, a huge, yeah, or huge, but just a, a string of, of uh, the entire text that we detected there. And obviously we can now again define functions as we saw earlier and put put these functions, let's say on the, so put the bill basically in this function and ask for instance, what's the amount due, which is the last, the last entry here. Um, we could pick the answer and you see that 6,170, uh, 6, which is basically what you see amount to here. You could also ask what's the total uh, uh, value and uh, point out the six, uh, 36,000 and so on. So it kind of interprets this. This goes all in context. Like I said, if this gets larger, then we have to stream over the, the, the document and so like stream over the uh, individual parts, chunk it again and so on or use even the document retriever or something like that to index it and, and to um, retrieve the information. Yeah, that's that. Then we have uh, here, also what I want to show you is this audio file that I have here from an interview pulled out from some past description. Does the world have to be concerned that there someday will be? Yeah, so do you see that this is basically just an MP3 file on my current machine? Um, and what we can use now is basically, oops, sorry, uh, you can use uh, Whisper to, you know, um, load the model. Right now we're loading it even offline. So it basically, so we have basically the, the model already pulled, it's on my machine. And uh, that, that model is actually fairly small, so we can work with it like this. 
and then we can just you know query it um whatever was uh, so let's let's look at the interview first maybe does the world have to be concerned that there will be a war in india and so on um so this is basically the interview that we saw there uh, or he heard there and this is the question that we placed here and see what, what was like the, the main topic about and you see here that uh, potential military conflicts and so on uh in pakistan uh, and, and so on so um, we this is what we get as a result. If you remember yourself that we always get a symbol back, so we get from the interview it's actually a symbol. We can say dot translate and to Mandarin in this case, uh, where John maybe can validate if it's correct. Yeah, I definitely. It's actually quite good Man because I think does the world have to be concerned? It transcribed it quite well. So that's that's whisper. Whisper is actually quite mm -hmm. quite good already. Let me let me take a look. 世界是否需要关心? That's that's correct. That's exactly right. The first sentence is translated okay. correctly. So uh, I think this um showcases that like if you want to do multimodal stuff, uh, what actually you need to do is just translate the different modes into text. And then mm -hmm. you can use the large language model, text-based large language model to just process the text directly. So like exactly. the OCR, the whisper is like OCR is an image to text provided there's text on the image. If there's no text on the image, you might be able to use stuff like image description, uh, image descriptors, like maybe blip, or like visual, mm -hmm. any visual question answer stuff that you can give you the description. Um, then mm -hmm. for, for audio, uh, Whisper can give from audio to text. So as long as you can exactly. get the domain back to text, you can use the LMs to continue from there. Exactly. And uh, yeah, and there are many other helpful functions in here, like extract and so on, where you can also place uh, like an extraction where it gets in a formatted way, for instance, all the countries involved uh, in this conversation were mentioned, um, and, and, and many, many others. I mean, there is this entire... I mean, if you want, you can also extract it in yes. JSON format. Yeah, you can use the same JSON formatter as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. So yeah, exactly. You can use that again. And, and there uh, has been some refactoring done lately. So we have now this operations because it's more cleaner. So we have actually the symbol class, um, which is very nice at the top somewhere here. Uh, and this gets all these helper functions, which are primitives that we call here uh, from this uh, ops package, where you see that there's like nice, nicely grouped uh, operations where we say they have comparison primitives, uh, expression handling primitives, and so on, uh, query primitives. And if you look in one of them, we see, for instance, the query, the convert, for instance, the transcribe uh, is also built in here, uh, and there are some others. So basically, this is um, what you see here, what I was basically using before, like dot .translate, dot .extract. Uh, we have execute and many other things. So you can just look it up here, uh, and they're nicely grouped in like logical groups, how they might belong together. Uh, yeah. Then that's that. Um, now, what we maybe also want to do is uh, we want to actually use, let's say, some. Uh, usually, there is in, in text and so graph structures and uh, entities connected to each other or relationships between entities. Um, for that, we have also another extended tool. This uh, we put everything that's basically not kind of like a core functionality or core expression, or that is composite basically. So composite of multiple other expressions. We kind of put it in the extended um, uh, graph. Uh, in this case, so in the extended uh, sub package, uh, in this case, the graph one, um, and where we also try to experiment around with it maybe over time and see how the community also reacts on it, says, okay, we need to change this and that or improve it. So some of them could be a bit like the OS command, for instance, a bit experimental. So this is a, that, that's why we kind of move them always into this extended uh, sub package. And this is one of them, uh, the graph structure, which kind of extracts from a text the relationships between entities. So you see that uh, John has a dog, and then it's basically how it extracts it is like John and dog, and there's one relationship, one. So basically, uh, uh, from, from John to dog, is there is a connection. Um, and what you also see is here this EOF and so on. So we see that, again, this kind of grammar style of, uh, of, of formatting. So we have this dollar uh, um, a lot larger sign that kind of says like it's the beginning of some expression or some, some thing that has to be processed. Uh, and then you see that John has a dog as a text, then the implication sign, and then that we know that when it terminates is end of file or so. 
uh, that was just a token that we chose. Um, but that's kind of the, the idea of, of um, how we process this information. And we do it sentence-wise in this case. So we can put in entire sentences and then it gets kind of implied the, the linguistic connections and so on between the entities. Um, yeah, there's some implementation stuff happening in here, uh, but what it basically uses is again, the, this, this formatter, in this case, we're using the sentence formatter because um, we split sentence wise and then we look at each individual sentence and try to extract the relationships between the entities involved. Um, yeah, so this is what you see here. Um, Very nice. It's actually using a large language model that is few short trained on how to extract entities and you mm -hmm. trained it um, using those few short prompts in order to generate the relational graph from a text. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I did here, I did the paragraph format just because I want to not spend any time on the processing right now. I just wanted to sweep over the interview once. I don't know how long the interview is. So we're just going to split it this way. Um, you see this interview again, the, the question, and now it this was with one paragraph sweeped over and all the relationships got extracted. So we see world, we see war, India, Pakistan, there's some two connections in here, we see this. Uh, and basically this is how it formats all, all, this, all this stuff. We could do it individually per sentence, but yeah, it doesn't really matter right now. Um, then I have here what I'm using. Um, this is just a helper for me right now because there's some API keys in a file, uh, which I don't want to open up right now. Um, and what I'm using here is actually for the visualization, because right now we just extracted the entities. Now you can use whatever tool you want to visualize that, where you have source target and some value. Uh, it's in a CSV format, um, but we have like uh, created under the uh, this umbrella of extensity AI, we have created basically uh, one of the uh, one third party tool with our own application because Symbolic AI, the framework actually has a built-in package manager. And I will show that later on in the command line. So what we do is basically in the future, we don't want to have everything like, you know, uh, placed in here in the extended. So we want to maybe just go wild, try something out and so on uh, and have like an idea or maybe with third party tools like graphics tree in this case. Um, and just easily integrate their, their tools into our framework. And what we came up with the idea is like using based on GitHub, uh, some structure, which is basically in this case, there's some GitHub um, username, extensity, and then the graphics tree is basically the repo name. Uh, so if you just provide this as a string in there, it would try to automatically pull from a repository that is uh, public, hopefully. If it's public, then it works anyways. If it's private, uh, then it works only for you, obviously, if you have access to with the SSH uh, keys and so on. Uh, so that's kind of the idea behind you. If you want to do it for your company, you might not want to ex uh, disclose your tools. You don't want to push it on our repo. We understand that. Then you can just build your own packages. But if you want to help the community, then also for the community, it should be easy to access these third-party tools and not have to wait for our reply or response to, you know, fill, uh, fill it in into the, our official repository and so on. So that's kind of the idea. And we have uh, this import expression. So the import expression itself is again, something similar to interface. They're actually very similar to each other. Just it's an import from some third party external thing. So from especially using GitHub. Um, so when what we basically stitch together, as you see here, the GitHub link with the module that we described, um, and then we try to you know manage and load the classes and all their respective uh, representations and there is a basic structure which I will show afterwards uh, uh, how we have uh, how, how we manage these so there's a package station how these packages are managed but they're like very simple and very intuitive to set up especially with one command um, so now without any further ado we just import this uh, graph visualization for a party tool um, and then we just feed it in this uh, CS comma separated values um, uh, straight um, um, object and what we get back is basically now this uh, URL because it's basically an embedded link. What we get back, so it's an iframe on a, a neatly designed third-party tool. So like I said, graphics tree is, is, is the ones that provide this. Um, and what we see here now is um, these are now the visualizations. I mean, obviously if we had a bit more text, we would see more connections and more things, but you see that from India, there's some connection to Pakistan and to China. Um, there is some, um, you know, other entities that are related to each other from, you know, uh, China, uh, from Taiwan to China, I think, or I don't know, I don't see the, 
the, the directional error right now. But anyhow, you, you kind of get the idea. Um, yeah, this is, like I said, experimental. We want to uh, work on this further on. I think John is also very intrinsically interested in graph yeah, representations. I, I think knowledge graphs with large language models are the way ahead to get mm -hmm. hierarchical representations. And um, early on, you saw how you can use large language models to extract entities. I think right now it's currently at the sentence level. It will be better if we do it at a whole paragraph level. Then the graph will contain more stuff, like not just from China to Pakistan, not just it will also contain about like China to World War, like, kind of other relations as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think this is a very cool feature that uh, we can actually use uh, this framework to generate the graph and we can visualize the graph. Uh, I mean, the import part is an is a separate thing where we actually can do like git pull request and create your own repository with just this import command. Yeah, so overall, I think, and, uh, yeah, yeah. you want to say something? Yeah, and, and streamline also the usage for everyone. That That's kind of the idea. So everyone that wants to just develop, develop an expression or something like that, I will show it later on how easy it is to, to create a new, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a new uh, extension here. Uh, so yeah, that's that. Um, now we go to more uh, maybe conversational parts because the, I think this is interesting for the next uh, uh, section. Um, I will show you one of our extended um, um, uh, expressions is the conversation expression, which is basically um, another, yeah, it's an object, uh, which is a memory object, has a sliding memory and so on. Um, but it's basically, you can, you know, how you go to open the eye and, you know, start interacting and chatting and so on. Well, in a way, this is kind of that, just you don't never have to leave your, your, um, um, your Jupyter notebook or your development environment. Um, and this is just an easy and nice way how we actually do also debugging on our machines or how we even develop our, sometimes we just get suggestions and we want to just co ge generate code and so on. So we kind of like use this on a daily basis already. Um, and parts of the code in the symbolic AI framework are already generated. Um, so this is exactly how, how we move forward. So for instance, we have this error in one of our development cycles where the PDF reader had some problems and the file and so on. And this is a known problem from the, from the library that we used. Uh, the PI PDF2. Um, and for instance, when we uh, use that, uh, so this is one of the file uh, engines that we're using in the background. So we can basically just start now a conversation uh, here and initialize it with some data as you see it here and maybe point to a code file. So in this case, this is the engine that we have uh, in, in the background somewhere here in backend uh, engine, where is it? Engine five. Engine five, yeah. So this is our file engine that kind of accesses, reads texts and files and so on. And the funny part is that this code that fixed the problem was generated. So we kind of generated this fix for us uh, and now it works better uh, when parsing PDFs. Yeah, instance. but that, but tell, please please tell the story of how this went because that, <laughs> yeah. that's actually the, the funny part yeah. is how it got uh, pushed. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, the funny part is I, I showed this in the demo uh, earlier once, and then I forgot that. Uh, so uh, let, let me first instantiate it. And that's that, that's the funny part. I asked the last comment thing here, uh, but yeah. So we first let's let's just link it up together and the data, and then we can ask it to fix. I mean, there is hopefully not to fix, nothing to fix anymore because it's already fixed. Um, but uh, just to give you the, the gist or the idea behind it. Um, so now we to try to read in the file. It, this has a, has a, it has a link to the file, it reads in the file. It has now a link to this data, which is an error message and uh, some instructions how to interact with it. And now you kind of start a conversation where it kind of suggests you the error is in the PDF, you see the package and so on and gives some instructions. And then it gives some su suggestions. In this case, I mean, the suggestions are, uh, like I said, it's, yeah, it's GPT-4 basically. Uh, I don't think they're, they're valid anymore because currently it works. Uh, but with the fun, funny part is when there was really the error in there, uh, I, I showed this command, which I will not execute now, um, but uh, it's basically committing um, what you just saw as a result. And what happens here is basically it tries to, you know, there you see this, this is a conversation here. So a conversation with Python or tags around it and all that stuff, and that's not runnable code. But the commit statement uh, of the conversation um, um, uh, expression 
is basically trying to use a code for method that we built in and tries to strap away all that comments and all that stuff and really make it, you know, just committing that to, to the actual um, to the actual file as a runnable executable Python code, for instance. Um, and when I did that back then, I just did it and I forgot about, you know, that I basically demonstrated that and linked it up. And then I committed the code and it actually worked better afterwards when, I, when we pulled and, and experimented with it. Uh, so that was the funny part that, that Leo actually mentioned. So we kind of so, used so the auto suggestion. It actually works because it corrected your code to make <laughs> yeah. it better. Yeah. Can you yeah, go through exactly. like how you replace? Because I didn't see a replace function inside the commit. Like how do you find the, the, the corresponding code to, to replace? So the, this is a formatter which uses the extract function. So we actually we're using our own framework again to put in the values that have been extracted and all the information that is available. And then we say only extract a code without the tags, uh, block markers and so on. And, and this extract function is specifically conditioned how to properly uh, decompose all and strap all that thing away or, or, because it, it's one of, one of the part of the prompt, uh, how the extract function itself uh, is designed. So you can look at the extract itself. Um, where is the prompt for the extraction? It's somewhere here, extract pattern. So you see how, how this is like looking at code things and other things and, 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 and knows how to follow instructions. So there is also like a from, this is the string that gets put in. Then the extract, so again, this grammar style of, of um, uh, you know, instruction, these models, and then basically the, the things that we request, and then the implication to what to extract. So this is how, how, how these things, and with this prompt alone, it, it kind of works fairly good. I mean, I'm not saying it's foolproof, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't be always trying to be in control and look at it afterwards and so on. Uh, but in most of the cases, for instance, um, especially when instructed to generate the entire code base, then it extracts really the neat code base and everything and and, and, and just gives a clean uh, reply, which you can then commit to a file and then just write that to the file. I see. So GPT-4 gives the entire program again as output. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which and is then nice. extracting the program and pasting it back. Uh, and, and, and Exactly, in the file. Exactly. Exactly. In this case, uh, I mean, be, be, be aware of if there are snippets. So if there are individual snippets like this, I mean, now you, you might get extracted all those individual snippets and pasted in here because I asked it only to fix that part. But if you ask it here, uh, rewrite the entire class and uh, uh, I think it's the error or something. In the problem to say, rewrite the entire exactly. code and output only the code uh, or something like that. Exactly. Because yeah. in this case, I just, I don't want it to elaborate too much on, on all the things around it because it shouldn't bother about that because that was not what I was requesting with the error. But if you generate the entire class structures, you just say full class generation, uh, do this and that. And I will show it in a second what I mean by that. Um, then you can use the commit and just commit the entire Understand. thing to, to um, the file. In this case, uh, since the assistant is a sequential memory assistant, mm -hmm. um, it means that whatever output and whatever input you give it is all stored in memory, right? So the next time yes. I call this assistant, it already knows what he has given me in the past. Right? It's already exactly. You can uh, just say no. I didn't. I didn't. So if you mean this right. one, this so, uh, sliding right. window, uh, right. kind of cool. memory, it is, right? It's as though you are talking on the open AI web browser interface. You just keep typing the the, the code, and yeah. then it already has the stuff in front. You know, Langchain tried to do this. They yeah. have a convoluted process uh, of memory. You use a conversational buffer or something like that. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I think with this, can, can you go back to the code again, the original code for sure. the on, on Jupyter Notebook? Jupyter Notebook on, on, on the Notebook. Oh, then, sorry, yeah. Yeah, there so you go. all you need to do to do it, maybe can you screw up again? All you need to do to get this conversational buffer style is to just have this import conversation. And how, how do we define it again? Can we scroll down? Because this is quite cool, right? Honestly, this is quite cool. You can just start a conversation like that, put in whatever mm -hmm. data you want. Okay, and then um, you just keep running assistant something, assistant something, and and you will continue. Uh, I mean, it, exactly. I mean, you can always just say uh, uh, empty object also, then you don't have any starting conversation. These are just helpers. You could just go like this and then start from a very, you know, empty structure. Uh, but usually you want to have some initial data or some filing, maybe some index. You can also provide indexes and so on. 
So what it is, it's actually it's a twofold memory here, actually, because it's a sliding window memory, which is like just at some point it just kicks out what, what was at the beginning. But it has also a linkage to an index, to an for external index. So what happens here is basically when you interact with it, it also pushes, uh, there is some store functionality here. So it also pushes to the external memory, the information. And in that external memory, you then basically can always retrieve. So you can always recall before answering. So basically what this does is it kind of like tries a recall. You put in some query, it tries a recall, then it gets something, some result back. And then uh, it answers based on the uh, indexed retrieval information plus the sliding window information and your query, obviously. Yeah, if I remember correctly, this is exactly the same as what's done for Symbia, the chatbot. You have a long-term memory and a short-term memory. In this case, the sliding buffer is the short term and the long term memory is the indexer where you index all the past conversations, perform retrieval mm -hmm. augmented generation to see what matches that query and mm -hmm. augment the chatbot with those information from the buffer from the exactly. long term. Exactly. Exactly. So we and, just uh, uh, I just wanna I just wanna mention like a quick uh, a quick note here. With the indexers, it's it's only tricky because uh sometimes you just have to reset them right because you don't want to mess up a uh, different portion of, of of code with some other portion of code and you perform uh it will do recall and it will give you like a code from a, a separate let's say code database or something like this in the case of Fimbia, which is a chat pod that you use uh uh yeah i i don't know for whatever you you're using it yeah, you yeah. might want to store more, right? And it, you mm -hmm. keep referring to previous conversations. But in terms of code, uh, you you always probably have to initialize it. And I guess Marius will show with the code generation and probably he, yeah. he, he, you will understand much, much uh, better uh, yeah. there. Why do you have to initialize it? And if you, if you use a different code repository, then probably you should not mix them up. Exactly. So there the, are the two things. I mean, Symbia is, is a chatbot. Uh, you can ask it about how do you feel and with the weather and search engine requests and crawls and whatever, yeah, other things. Um, uh, but but that might not be relevant for just a um, conversation with some data, maybe some files and, and some things that you just want to, to narrow it down. And, and you don't want to have the like branching of uh, if this case is here, then context to this, if this I is that and, and so yeah. on. So this, this is, is like more just a stream of stateful conversation. So you exactly. hold the conversation, but we pass history of messages, but no tool use at all. So it's not like Symbia. Symbia is actually a conversational agent that has two use. This is purely just conversation. Uh, yeah, I summarize. I mean, I mean, it's one one tool is used. I mean, Pinecone is used to be fair because of the long term memory. Yeah. But you could maybe have your own local indexing engine, uh, what you have there, and then basically use that. But one tool is used for for this. Um, but yeah, exactly. The rest is fully correct. And now there's a neat thing that we can do with this, uh, especially code generation now, as, it, as, as Leo mentioned, it, using third party plugins, uh, maybe, and repositories and all that stuff. Um, and for that, we also generated basically, uh, again, uh, an old package, Extensity AI, CodeGen. Uh, we import that thing, and that thing can take also some docs URL, basically, which is in this case a repo. Uh, and and uh, this is just saying that please don't initialize it right now because when I instantiate this object now, uh, otherwise we would have to wait for one hour. So what's happening here in the background is our friends from Langchain Basic were pulling their entire code base, um, and what we're doing is then basically indexing the entire code base of them. Uh, so and and like everything. So if you look in, in into this, um, yeah. uh, this is basically the package that you just saw there. Um, and I will explain in a second how also this, this packaging and so on works. But uh, this is the code generator. And what you see here is, uh, yeah, this was the docs URL that we had there. And we said in this case, don't initialize it, just use an existing index. Um, but if we would initialize it, then what it happens is it goes for this repository cloner. So it basically clones the entire repository. Uh, repository. Then it basically merges things together and you know all the files that are kind of um, uh, that we want to look at. And there is a predefined list of like Python files, text files, some stuff like that, some things that we want to ignore. Um, and then we have basically this uh, archive PDF parser. So every time we find some URL, this is basically a, a archive URL. So we take that URL and so all cross-referenced papers and so on that are available are pulled. 
Um, and then we basically create this huge, huge data object uh, and feed all of that and index all of that in, into our into our um, uh, vector store. How, how many how many vectors uh, uh, were stored? I think you you had that. Yeah, I think okay, it's fun somewhere. Thumb yeah, it's one hundred twenty two hundred twenty two thousand or something like that. That's that's why I said it takes an hour or so. Yeah, to to do that. So we won't do that now uh, on this recording. But yeah, that that's a hundred. It's like I don't know somewhere in the realm of of what was ten million tokens or whatever tokens. Process. Yeah. So uh, maybe yeah. I summarize a bit. So this import statement, what it does, it creates a new repository. It loads the entire Langchain documents into that repository. And at the same time, you also do, if you put data in it, you also do, if you put data in it, it's true, you will do uh, the chunking and storing of the embeddings into Pinecone. Is, is, that, is that right? So we have uh, Pinecone here, for instance. Um, and what we can look at is one of the indexes that we have is the code index, which you see here. And this code index is basically uh, where we have it. Here is the, the number of vectors that we throw into this code index. Um, and uh, not quite right. So the, not, we're not creating a repository. We are basically just, first of all, we're pulling an existing plugin, if you want so, third party plugin. This is CodeGen from Xense DI. Then we're using, um, we're pulling the entire repository from Langchain. So we're really just pulling from GitHub the repository on some just temporary storage. It's basically in the, uh, where is it? Packages. So when we do that, we just put it in the home directory, sumi AI, and then packages. And then uh, I think code gen, uh, sorry, not, not packages, repos, sorry. So, so it basically just dumps the entire repository here. Um, that's what, what's happening with this line. And then um, we are initializing an index if we don't say explicitly, don't do that. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 that, so it's, that's it's basically like that. you pull the repo to a local drive. And then mm -hmm. if you set data in it to be true, you do the chunking and the uh, embedding. Yeah. Stuff. yeah so, exactly. So early on, we had talk to document. This is actually very cool. This is, I, I call this talk to website, right? <laughs> this is the yeah. entire yeah. GitHub. You can talk to yeah. the entire GitHub directly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's that's really cool because if you look at this now, we have apparently they have something with general relativity, some prompts in there. <laughs> so I was like thinking, like, why not uh, write a long chain fusion right. prompt let, template? Let, 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 let's see it. Come, yeah. let's see it. Sorry. Uh, yeah, see, uh, see it live. Yeah, exactly. So what we're doing now is basically we're now it's it's the same principle as in the conversation class, just in this case with the. Um, with the, this this generator code generator and more focused on code generation, so there are more, more tweaks a bit towards code generation, and then basically it just tries to pull this information from the index, put that into the memory, uh, combine all these things together, and then generates based con conditioned on the uh, on the you know the entire repository of Langchain uh, their future prompt template. Yeah, very cool. Actually, with some um... External and yep. Uh, let's take a look at the prompt first. So this will give me a length chain few short prompt template. Yeah. That uh, manages to to talk about general rel relativity. Yeah. Explain general this is yeah. as simple as possible. Um, there is a theory about mm -hmm, and then you can basically yeah, uh, and uh, install long chain and, and and fire up this template. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Uh, one one other thing is that uh, people, uh, at least on the internet, they usually uh, cry that Langchain <laughs> doesn't have a, a a good documentation. So uh, one of our next things is to have like a, a theme doc package, which basically would help them to figure out the uh, maze <laughs> there of you Langchain. Go. <laughs> yeah, so this is called talk to Langchain. <laughs> yeah, this is talk to Langchain exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you know, exactly. recently yeah. there have been people also doing like talk to YouTube videos. I'm very sure, right, if you have the right engine to download the YouTube video and to pass it into text, like maybe OCR, you can mm -hmm. essentially talk to a YouTube like videos yeah. as well. Yeah. Exactly. So that yeah. that's the whole multimodality. And, and I mean, um, and this is <clears> actually that's, 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 that's not 
that's not about multimodality. That that would be nice if some other people would come and also contribute to our framework because they exactly. we need all the help, right? To extend to all these tools. We are just two persons right now. Yeah, exactly. That's that brings me exactly with my interlude to the to the uh, to the last part of the of this session. Um, I mean, you saw it multiple times right now already. Uh, this um, import here uh, in placed in here with some some name and some repository. Uh, and now I want to show you actually how easy it is to use so really extend symbolic AI. Um, I'm just gonna pull up this um, uh, command line prompt thing here. So basically the what we have is like I told you before, there's a package manager uh, already built in, in the, into our framework. And the package manager works uh, by just saying sim. So usually we, our tools are always with sim. So chat was in the last meeting that we had, for instance, where you can you know open up the chat pop. Uh, sim shell was if you want to have a shell command and then you ask it some shell command thingy here. Uh, so our usual thing is always a, 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 a prefix with sim. And in this case, it's sim um, and we have package. So the shortcut package, and we can look at packages that I, for instance, have on my machine installed, um, which is basically just uh, these extensity AI things from our repositories that we have a third party repositories for that, for those things. One of them being CodeGen, one of them being Preface Tree, some, uh, some proprietary more things, some meme generator, because we have memes, or some time zone thing. And let me just show first a little example how this works. So uh, when we have the sim package, for instance, it's a list of all the packages that I have on my machine installed. Uh, we, and if there would be another package, I could just simply say sim package and just say I install, or I think if I just put it directly in like this, AI. so even if there is like time zone, it is already available. Zone is already available, but just for the sake of showing it. Um, so it would just you know, look it up, see it's okay, it's already installed. And that's how you basically install a package. Um, so, but now let's say we want to uh, run a package and there is a dedicated command for that, sim run. Um, and with sim run, you can also look at the things that are runnable on my machine right now. So that's a L for list. Um, and actually there are some aliases created. So if I just say, for instance, I don't know, sim run, uh, and I go for this, uh, I don't know, mail, for instance, why did my, Sorry, uh, uh, Amazon uh, package not arrive. That's the, the not acceptable, acceptable, right? Because I really had the problem really, really recently. So I can't now basically, that, sorry. So, sorry about that, but that, that's what <laughs> So now it basically, I just give it some, yeah, you know, I use the Sumron command with the mail package. And now I just give it some, some things that I want it to generate. And now it generated a full-fetched email and saying, dear customer service, I hope this mail finds you well, yada, 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 and so on. And it tries to be nice, of course, and, and so on. Um, uh, and this is basically how we created our helper when we write emails. Sometimes we just you know throw in some keywords and just you know let it figure out the, the email things for us. Or for instance, with you, John, um, because we're in different time zones, <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, we we were always like annoyed that we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I'm in back the, and forth. Exactly. Central so I think I've got a so very um, good analogy for this. These are widgets. <laughs> these are exactly like widgets. These are little. <laughs> yeah, they're widgets. Yeah. Little functions that you code out using uh, symbolic AI. Basically, they are expressions. And then you can just run them on like a certain query or a certain input, and then out comes the answer. Exactly. So what is it? 2 p.m. says we're in the Central European time zone. I, I am, you are not. Uh, and then I can ask what is it in Sing Singapore time zone. Uh, so it's basically, and what, what I'm using here in this package, for instance, is also for packet third party package. So I'm also letting it be very verbose because I want to verify things, what it does. Um, so it, what, what it kind of does is just says it's basically UTC plus two, and then it says, okay. Uh, step one, convert everything to UTC. And from UTC, then it goes back to basically converting maybe, it uh, may, maybe to in Singapore. Yeah, may, may, maybe to 12, 12, 12 half right now. It's you. It's your right. 12, 30, you mean PM? Yeah, because I that's know. right now in, in SES. Yeah. 
yeah ah yeah and, right. and, and john can confirm john can confirm exactly that that's the actual time there <laughs> hopefully it is the right time um but yeah that that's basically how Twelve thirty. uh okay that is that your time now 12 30 yeah it yeah. should be now 12 yeah, 30 p.m 6 30 singapore time here yes goes. so yeah that's that neat tool that we also use uh to to help us out nowadays um and there you, know, you can come up with any tool you want and one of them being let's say, also the code generator so the code generator can be triggered directly from the command line if you want to, to run it and don't want to have anything else code and then i don't know like we had that before with the long chain thing um, maybe show but, maybe show how you created the other uh, uh, aliases uh yeah exactly uh to do this now you saw before that we did basically so let me clean up a bit here uh soon package we did and when we install a package that you use i or directly the package then we can basically just uh let me look at what packages i have installed um and let me look what aliases I, I have some run list so these are the packages and they're below the, are the aliases. For instance, I don't have anything for a meme generator. Um, so with, what I could do now is basically, I can not obviously say sim run. Um, I can so directly say sim run and I think I can just say uh, extend CT AI slash meme gens and so on. And then so I don't know, a cat with a cat. And I think uh, this is the interface I'm not sure anymore. But anyhow, that's kind of cumbersome, right? Um, yeah, I use it wrong, anyhow. Um, but that's kind of cumbersome to do it this way, right? Uh, so uh, that's the reason why we have these aliases. So when we create a certain run, we can just create an alias, like meme, and then basically just put in this uh, this string here. And then that's, that's what we're getting registered now. So we're getting basically a new uh, alias meme registered and from now on we can basically just say sim run meme and then I, I don't know what the interface of this tool is uh, yeah so actually this uh like can, can, can be tools also widgets or tools so there are custom user tools that people can create and anyone else can yeah. download those tools that people have created or you can exactly take so. plugins I guess <laughs> I mean open AI plugins I mean similar concept yeah, exactly. So this is this is how how we do it with this. And now how to create uh, own tools because you probably are interested in how does it work. And that's actually we have an own tool for that. Swim Dev for developers. C for create. And now you can say for instance X N C T A I slash I don't know John. You get your own one right now. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. basically, uh, what we're doing here is basically we're saying create a new uh, tool which gets created, you see it here already in this directory that was actually very fast. You can click on it, it opens it up. Yeah, I trust my tool. So um, anyone and, can create tools and it will all go in the package folder. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Everything is in the package, well, it's not checked in obviously right now, but uh, you can check it in afterwards. You can just say git in it and, and then basically if you have a repository, you can just put it. And it will be uploaded stuff. to um, Symbolic AI's GitHub automatically every time you create one. Exactly. Not, not, not Symbolic AI's GitHub, no. your own GitHub. It not, it's not our GitHub. GitHub. Yeah, you you should have the like right access to whatever you see, put in there. So and if you have I uh, share my tool with other people, uh, so to to have you mean what uh what tools exist, right? So what we want to do for that is also we want to just have a web uh, hosting that's uh, what I'm working on right now, where we see like all the packages with all the names that are available. That's very simple. You can just search it up and have descriptions and so on. We're working currently on that. Um, so, and that to show you how this works and how we can find packages again later. So when we create a new tool, you know, like your John tool, for instance, um, you can basically have, uh, so that's the name of the package, as you see, so there's a package.json here, uh, with a version number with, uh, you know, the, the name of the, uh, the repository name and, uh, the username and repository name. Um, so here would be probably your, your own repository and whatever repo name you choose. And then you have a description telling us or telling what, what it is about. Um, and now basically you get one e expression. So these are all the expressions that are registered. So you could have a list of expressions that are registered that people could then later on instantiate and import. Um, 
And in this case, there's only one expression and one runnable expression. So that's actually the, if we say directly just import and the name of the package, so import extensive DI John, then actually this runnable expression is the one that is uh, loaded. And there could be but others that can there get could exported be basically. expressions or composite expressions that you call, but the user cannot call them. Your, func your main expression can call them. So yeah, exactly, and, and this is the, the one that you instantiate with the import, but you could load a list of all the expressions available that you export. There is a, a functionality for that. Uh, I don't want to elaborate along on that, but um, where you see in the import functionality, or maybe let quickly show it, but. So it's okay, I think we time. will show this another time because like right now, this is still early stages. Uh, maybe just show like how we can write the function and then uh yeah we can go through more details when this whole server is up yeah. exactly so but anyhow the, the point is uh you have now with where is it kind of lost track of it too many things so you have basically just to give a description have to give uh, some expressions and so on and then you kind of see exactly the base structure already what what we have uh, uh all of you see the class my expression. expression it's all exactly for you or you just need to modify your init and your forward yeah, exactly. That's that's all you need to basically do. So that's the, that, that's the neat part. So it's it's about in the first stage, we want people just to try it out. And this is the easiest way you can try it out. Uh, and the next step, we're gonna you know make this repository available with all people can just register the, the tools there. Um yeah, I mean the easiest like way pi, pi, pi. you can also read the you can also read the uh the readme file for for yeah. uh, the, this use cases because we have them uh, uh detailed there. Uh, actually, I can yeah. create my own first package already. You just you change the function description, uh, create a poem, uh, create a hundred. You can make poem. your own JSON, JSON parser mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. No, but right now, if we look at this format, um, it's already a function. So I just need to modify yep. the function description. I have my own package. Yeah, so exactly. Actually, yep. this is an LM based. And, and you can host it. Uh, you can host it privately. You don't have to put it publicly exactly. if you don't want. Yeah, that, that was the idea. So if you don't want to share all of the things, so obviously we would love that people contribute directly to the repository. So it, that's how, well, where we yeah. start inviting people I again. Do, I can do one um, um, passing. Yeah, mm -hmm. because I'm going to work in that area soon. Yeah, graph. So it's, that would be super cool for all the extensions, all things contribute to repository fixes. I mean, there are probably many things that have to be debugged and whatever, but that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also, if you just want to have for your company, for your private uses or some experiments, so you can make your own private GitHub, put everything there, and you don't have to interface with us uh, directly, so to say, and push all the code to us. Uh, so you can just easily set up a new package and a new tool and then, you know, start it up and, and get it uh, running without, like, that was actually no code thing right now. It, it was basically just one command line uh, that I had to throw in. Actually, actually this it. is quite cool. Uh, once you get this set up and people can contribute to a public repo, um, then mm -hmm. essentially those um, functions or those expressions that are, or we call them packages, those packages that are more popular and mm -hmm. like basically stuff that are more useful, I believe this can then be incorporated in the main framework. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it exactly. Could, it and could work like that. And yeah. we can also make a list if it is more with the things that we like. So if people really like things, then we can make here a list of like packages that we like a README uh, that we kind of third party verified or so. But that, I don't know. Let, let's see how that how that works out. We want also people to first of all just try it out, give us feedback, and see how this this all this thing works out. Very nice. So we and, go to, uh, again, to create and, to create the package. You use sim dev. Then you type mm -hmm. the letter C and then you type in the destination of where your package wants to be, and all the mm -hmm. templates will be there already with the base. I mean, you always have help and so on, so you can also see with, with the help or if you do it wrong, for instance, that you get back, you know, some, some uh, how, how this works, and you see the commands that are available. So that's that's actually very easy to, to, to use. So we have the main three tools are sim package again, maybe to iterate that sim package. If there is a, some existing package out there already. You can just you know uh, look what what functionalities we have, um, which is basically installing, removing, you know, listing all of them, or maybe updating one because it's based on our GitHub. Uh, then we have the sim run, where you can also see that you can just you know execute um, with aliases, especially if you don't want to have very verbose. So you can create aliases with this one. Also list all the existing aliases, maybe remove some. 
and then just run with the you know swim run Elias and then whatever arg arguments list you have. And the last one is the swim dev, right? Because you want to maybe create your own um, tools, right. maybe right. share it to community and so on. Um, and then basically that's that's the way to go. So you can have your own LM functions without even opening Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook. You run it from your console, your terminal. Exactly, or and, and one editor or so, yeah. or Nano or whatever you prefer. Yeah, that's right. that's it for today. I think it was an extensive uh, introduction into the realm realm of uh, symbolic AI. Um, and, and uh one one other thing i want to add um uh, we also have uh, the documentation page uh maybe yeah, you can show you. that on the on the read on the redox and that will also be populated uh with examples for each co co component and so on we, we will work on that too so that you can so, basically quickly uh, so quickly search yeah. this is the so you see, AI web page right now yes so this is the readme, uh, by the way. So you can have here the documentation. Also, by the way, these the tutorials that we're doing with John, uh, we're now officially including them in the in the uh, repo. So you can just look at tutorials, look in the past with other things, concepts we had in mind, and, and other you know um, features and so on. We described already. Um, and here's the documentation that just Leo mentioned. Thank you very much, Leo. So we have the, obviously the read the docs thing, which is kind of part of it. This, but the nice thing about read the docs is it's a, a bit more structured because it also has the code and so on indexed. So you have this general index where you see all the classes, functions. You can just you know ask something in here and see uh, if if you go to the yeah, just instance. just just open one. Uh, so that uh, yeah, we can so explain to people cash, what friends. what they should expect. So yeah. you see here the cache for sim cache and so on, and then you see that there is some you know parameter descriptions and stuff like that. What and documentation in general. Uh, and yeah, you see so, that so you should expect here. Major. Yeah, you should expect here to see like uh, how to use the decorator or something like this. In this case, it's a decorator, so mm -hmm. you 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 can exactly. expect to see a use case. Basically, how 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 to use this decorator? Yeah, exactly. Probably uh, probably not as useful as the components or some other thing, expressions or symbols or some other thing that uh, people are might might be using. But we we tend to to populate this uh, documentation to be much more affordable to people. And by the yeah. way, we also had this uh, idea: always keep. Um, in the era of uh, AI and uh, retrieval augmented generation, you should always have a one uh, pager of documentation that's easily parsable for people to uh, properly search for things so if they can, want, you right? Can, you can talk to symbolic AI soon. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I mean, yeah, you can yeah, put the yeah. URL there, you can do the same thing as what you did for LangChain. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. exactly. You, oh, yeah, yeah. And that's also how the documentation will work in the future. Actually, we will have our own simdoc command. We're working on that right now. We can just ask, how do I create this function? Here we yeah, go. You can just say, I would like to create a function doing this. Then the yeah. talk to symbolic AI will do the function for yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> the, the idea behind yeah. the idea behind simdoc is that it's, it will not necessarily be only with uh, uh, GitHub or code. Uh, you can also have grab for example it's a very common tool to to uh, pick up things in terminal right to look to search for word or text or something like this in different files so you might not know all those commands and stuff like this so uh, what we aim to do is to uh, everything that has a manual attached like if you are a linux guy you can you can uh, you can know the man command and anything that has a man or help can be then uh, uh, put into simdoc and uh, together with an indexer, maybe because some things are long, uh, you you just uh, 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 perform then uh, uh, talk to whatever documentation you you have. Exactly. I think this is going to be super important in the future. This is like, I mean, one of the coolest tools that you can build with uh, uh, large language models is exactly this to help you mm -hmm. navigate the complexity of different uh, documentations yes. and codes and whatever APIs. Yeah. Exactly, and and especially, I mean, we we, we stick to a word because we had a vision also on the, on the repository here already, and this are incremental steps towards that vision. So there are like this self-healing and self-evolving uh, 
systems. And that's uh, kind of also the philosophy of our framework. It's like eat your own dog food. So that's, we, we're starting already to generate code with our own. So like we're only two developers right now, right? So we kind of need to, in a week or so, we kind of made a huge leaps all the time, right? How do we do that? Because we're kind of bootstrapping from our own framework and starting to, you know, generate parts of code, generate, uh, you know, or verify and validate code that has been created by us. And then I like, see, okay, then we might have missed something. And we're going into this direction where but the future work section really says. So we're going towards self-evolving systems. Uh, these are steps towards that. These are, you have to have documentation. You have to have uh, these things all built in that you can easily access it and then start code generation automated way and, you know, uh, conditioning and so on. So these are, these are things that we kind of really follow down the line. And this is also where the community could support and help us uh, because of resources. One of the most important things right now is that we're on the private budget. So if anyone says like, this is a cool project, we want to support these guys, this is the vision they're heading towards, but there's a lot, there's a gap there, right? To get there. So even if it's just, you know, some either financial or compute resources, whatever you can provide or just liking, sharing or so that, that will be amazing and, and helps out uh, for us to, to grow our community and uh, obviously spread the ideas. I, okay. mean, I mean, John already is doing that work exactly. for yeah. us. Thank, thank, Kudos thank to you, John. Man. Thank you. Yeah, it, uh, it, thank you. It, thank, thanks for incorporating my feedback and everything. You know, like the functions thing was actually done because of me. So I'm mm -hmm. quite grateful for that. Yeah. I really feel this uh, symbolic yeah. AI framework is so flexible, much more flexible than Langchain. I actually like it more. Uh, and you, you, you see, you can just do talk to document, talk to website. We just like three lines, right? So that's really a service because companies actually charge for this. So, I mean, if any of you are, are interested to do work like this, um, that uses all this, and like, if you like them to develop further, yeah, feel free to reach out to Marius and Leo. I, I think um, this is something that is really, really going to be impactful in the future. And like the conversational framework, is so easy to use. You just need to put conversation and they can and go already. It's, it's really quite intuitive. And yeah, I, I really enjoyed this session. I, I myself will be using some of this as well. So I'll let you know like whether there's any issues, but so far I see it looks quite easy to integrate. So like all this uh, pine cone retrieval of ranked generation, very native in the framework and I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we, 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 okay. we have this idea of, uh, maybe you can see from the way we wrote the code. So uh, it's, uh, basically if you are a PyTorch user, it's, it's already easy to <laughs> use our framework mm -hmm. because it, it follows uh, this PyTorch very heavily. Uh, uh, yeah. very heavily. I mean, we we were inspired by PyTorch like a lot. The, the, <laughs> those those guys know what they do. So yeah, <laughs> we we try to follow like the best uh, in terms of how do and also make it accessible, right, for some other people yeah. to adapt. If you know already Torch, it's already easy to understand. Like, okay, this this component has a forward. That's all I have to understand. Or like, I need a forward mm -hmm. or stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, anyway, okay. I've got to go already. I think it's been a long session and we've really seen a lot of capabilities and hope to see more. And yeah, so uh, thanks so much, uh, Leo and Marius. I enjoyed the uh, sharing session today and I'll definitely mm -hmm. be using it more for the retrieval augmented generation part. This uh, looks very easy to use. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank not, you. Thank so you, John. Till next time. Yeah. See ya. Bye, everyone. Till next Bye. time. Bye.